Okay, now it's adding up the participants. So there are some, okay. we're up to 15, we're up to 21. Oh, that's good. Yay. <laughs> You're all coming in now, 27, 30. Oh, I don't even know who this is. I'm going to decline because I don't know who that is. Uh, okay, Sarah, we're on. They can hear us. Okay, well, let me mute. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to mute. Don't mute. Okay, everyone. Um, welcome. If you don't mind, if one of you would uh, just say in the chat, you can hear us and you can see us. Just one. If one of you answers, you don't, the rest of, okay, yes and yes, we're good. We're good to go now. Welcome everyone to the 2020 uh, training for our poll watchers. Uh, I wanna welcome all of you. Looks like there's a bunch of you. So thank you for coming tonight. Uh, 67 of you is amazing. We're recording this and we will have it available for others. So people who come after today and people who couldn't make it today will still have an opportunity. We'll let, let y'all know, let them know when we're gonna have more of these. Okay, everyone stop texting me because everyone can hear it and we're all in now, right? Um, I'm Cindy Branham. I do communications for the Madison County Democrats and I am here just to be your kind of coordinator today. I wanna to introduce Sarah Bradley, who's been doing this for a long time. And Sarah, if you'll give yourself, she's gonna be your instructor today. If you'll give yourself a brief in introduction and I'll bring up the slides when you're ready for me to. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your afternoon to participate in 2020 general election poll watcher training. Uh, poll watcher training basically should be nonpartisan, even though this training is sp uh, sponsored by the Democrats, uh, the Madison County Democrats to be specific, and our partner, Democratic partners throughout the state. We also probably have some Democrats that are on here from maybe all over the country. Again, we welcome you. Uh, I've been a poll watcher since the 90s. Uh, poll watching is a very serious matter. Uh, poll watchers should basically be seen and not heard. Uh, and poll watchers should, anything that they think is a situation, they should bring it to the inspector. Or uh, in some places, it's called a uh, precinct captain. But whoever's in charge of that voting precinct, that is the person you take your concerns to. This time, we're going to have a brief video uh, that just really talks a little bit about the voting process. And uh, Cindy will come up with the video. Yes, she will. Just a second. And for housekeeping, while she's there, if you have any questions, there's a QA. Uh, QA and put your questions in. Uh, we also, I see people already in the chat. Uh, I'm going to ask you to go ahead uh, once the video starts to mute yourself. I'm going to mute myself. And people like me that usually do stop video, of course, that's always felt. Again, thank you for your. Free and honest elections are a cornerstone of America, they form a crucial part of our infrastructure. And just like the water or the garbage pickup, damage to our elections causes chaos. And in today's hyperconnected world, voters need to know that their votes will be counted and the personal information used to verify their identity won't be stolen or misused. But why would an attacker, a prankster, a thief, or even a foreign government try to compromise an election? Everyone wants their candidate to win, and some aren't willing to accept lawful results. Personal information is valuable and can be sold online. Pranks can be more dangerous than ever, and some attackers just enjoy causing chaos. Smart security practices at the polling place are important to prevent multiple types of attacks. There are many different weak points that attackers may target. Poll books can be stolen. Electronic voting machines can be hacked or disabled. Tabulations can be altered, especially if the attacker has access to the system. It can seem impossible to prevent something like cybercrime, but you can do more than you realize. Common sense and knowing emergency procedures are your best weapons. Now let's take a closer look at some election security safety tips. Be familiar with your state's regulations for accepting and checking ID, 
registering voters on site, and referring lost voters to their correct polling place. It's important to know the rules surrounding poll watchers in your state, including the procedures for recording their IDs and what you can expect from their visits. Your polling place may get a visit from journalists. Make sure you're familiar with what to expect from a media visit, including the importance of maintaining voters' privacy in the voting booths. We've already mentioned cybersecurity, but there are specific cybersecurity concerns when you're working on an election. Social engineering is a term for lying or impersonation. In a polling station, a social engineer might ask for network access just for a minute or pretend to be a maintenance worker in order to access the voting machines. Phishing, a type of attack where someone sends a phony message to trick people into handing over valuable information, is a form of social engineering. Hacking is the use of technology to subvert other technology, such as inserting computer viruses or breaking someone's password. The best way to prevent hacking in a poll station is to restrict access to the network, computers, and sensitive documentation. There are many ways voting systems can be tampered with. You may already be familiar with dangers like theft, voter impersonation, and repeat voting. When you're working at a polling place, it's important to be aware of what your responsibilities are and what sort of tactics criminals might use. Confirm who has access to what equipment and areas, and don't be afraid to ask questions. Protect your computer equipment with strong passwords. If a computer virus gets access to your systems, it will spread as quickly as a real virus. Think about ways a computer virus could get into the network. Do your computers have internet access? Are people bringing in equipment and drives from home? Remember, if you see something, say something. Know your reporting procedures and who to talk to if you suspect a problem. Be familiar with contingency plans and ready for them. When serving as a poll worker or judge of election, you serve as a safeguard for democracy. Protecting elections protects not just the nation, but the people who trust in and rely on that nation. By paying close attention to potential security concerns and using your common sense during an election, you'll be providing a vital check on danger and corruption. There, you're, you're muted. Have you ever wondered about how we I'm secure sorry, elections? Excuse me, excuse me, excuse <laughs> That's me. a fair question. Okay. Security <laughs> has always been at the heart of what election officials do, which is why each state and jurisdiction has met. Okay. <laughs> okay. At this point, we will go ahead and um, we'll see. I see some uh, information in the chat. Uh, these are just people to tell that they can hear. Okay, they're here. And um, at this point, we will go ahead. And first, I'd like to talk about a few things before I get to the uh, charts about what we should expect specifically in Madison County, because this is the county. It's generally the same, but I wanted to talk specifically a few minutes about Madison County. Uh, and Madison County, in this election, the only certified poll workers will be from the parties, either the Republican. Republican Watch Party you. or the Democratic Party. Your letter of certification should come from one of the parties, not the candidates. In the primaries or runoffs, you can bring a letter from a candidate. In the general election, the letter of certification as a poll watcher should come from one of the political parties, uh, Republican, Democrat, um, Libertarian, whichever party you are representing. Also, when you- Sarah? Yes. Can I make a correction? You said poll worker. We do this constantly. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we don't all do. We do that every time. I'm yeah, sorry, poll, poll watcher. watcher. Because I, I wear both hats, people. And so uh, bear with me. If I say poll worker, I mean poll watcher. <laughs> okay, just bear with me. This is a poll watcher training. So when you report for poll watcher training, you carry your certification to the inspector. Uh, one thing that has happened in the past, and I've observed this in several precincts, where a poll worker, poll watcher will come in and give the um, letter to a poll worker. And that worker may sit the letter aside. And you may be sitting there, and then the inspector or the sheriff or someone from downtown uh, with an election will come and ask you, uh, uh, speak to you, and you'll say, I gave my uh, information to this lady or 
person and the inspector does not have a record of it. So it's very important that you give your information to the inspector. The inspector will be identified with a badge as well as the uh, workers. And there's also an, an assistant inspector. And I am, I'm going out here on the limb a little bit, but in some of the large precincts for this election, there may be more than one assistant inspector. But at any rate, go ahead and make sure you give your certification letter to the inspector because that information is recorded in the official record of that precinct. Also, if you're going to be a poll wa uh, watcher, and uh, this is for me as well, try to show up about 15 minutes before your uh, agreed upon time. And at the end of the uh, election, at 7 o'clock, 7.45, there will, there will be people still in line. And so if you choose to leave or if you need to leave by 7 o'clock, I suggest that you can. Uh, approach the inspector and let them know that you are le uh, will be leaving. At that time, the inspector may or may not let you sign uh, official documents. If they do not, that's okay because they have your letter. But if you choose to stay, and this is something that I've observed before, if you choose to stay and the inspector has locked the door at seven o'clock, but everyone that is in that line is allowed to vote, you will be asked to stay until everyone is voted and the machine records. That is for security. Uh, also, because once the door is locked for people entering or exiting, supposed to stay locked until after the ballot uh, ballots have been counted. So if you think you need to leave, please leave around 645, 650, so that you will not be uh, in a situation where you may have not planned to be uh, away uh, from home or you have other things, you have to do that at the evening. You won't be in that situation. Um, those are some of the main things that I wanted to say. Um, also, make sure uh, if someone is preparing to bring you food, if you're going to be at, in a, um, at a precinct, uh, make sure that you know what time, approximately what time they will be delivering your lunch uh, and, or, or your snacks. Uh, we at the Madison County Democrats, once you come to get your letter, there's usually a little bag that will have some information in it for you and a snack and a bottle of water. Usually that's what we, uh, in Madison County, that's what we provide to our poll watchers. Okay, any, any questions so far? Okay. Sarah, I will say that we're only providing meals to people who work an eight hour shift or more this year. Great. Right. Well, I was I was specifically talking about the little snacks that are in the bag, but if they, of course, that's why I said if they're doing a going to be there for a length of time where they're going to bring a lunch, be aware of what time they're bringing the lunch. Because the person bringing the lunch will have to go around the line and come up to the front, and we don't want anything to happen where people think, well, they're breaking the line or they're doing. Um, something that's infringing upon my rights because I've been standing in this line for four hours. Uh, so just be aware so you can meet the person uh, to get your lunch. Mm -hmm. At this point, if we have no, I see something in the chat, Cindy. Um, you're asking about um, attendance. I'm gonna go through here and take, take attendance shortly. Okay. While you're watching the slides, but the people who have phone numbers on, you've got to stay on until past the end so that I can get your names, because all I can see is your phone numbers right now. But yes, you can't go into the precincts if we don't know that you've had the training. So I'm going to take care of that. Okay. At this time, we will have the first slide. Go ahead, Cindy. Can you not see it? I see it, but I uh -oh. I see it, but I'm ready for you to go into the come on, go on down, scroll on down. Okay, the responsibility, our responsibility is to ensure that every eligible voter is permitted to vote. 
and to ensure, ensure that there's no voter suppression, intim intimidation, or irregularities. Ensure that Alabama law is followed and document and report problems that arise. When you document, you should have a little note. Bring, if you don't have one, bring a little notepad with you so that you can write down any irregularities that you see. Also, bring, make sure that you have a phone number to the um, headquarters. And also you should have a phone number to if you are, even though you are representing the party, if you have an interest for a particular uh, candidate, have that phone number as well. Uh, there are other uh, partners that phone numbers, they will put their phone numbers on the website where you can con contact them if you see something that you think uh, is uh, an irregularity. If you see something that you see is a irregularity, uh, what you should do is go to the inspector, not the worker, to the inspector and bring it to the inspector's attention. At that point, the inspector will address it or the inspector may say they don't see that as a problem. Either way, make sure you make a note of it. And if it's something that needs attention, please call the headquarters a step out um, and, and make a phone call and call the headquarters and let them know what is going on in this particular precinct. Uh, you don't want to confront anyone because at the end of the day, we don't want to lose, win the battle and lose the war. So you wanna be mindful of that when you're talking to inspectors. Some inspectors, um, are very uh, poll watcher friendly. Some inspectors feel that it is basically just something they have to do. And that is all that they're, they're not gonna interact with you that much. Uh, and also when you come in, there should be a place for you that has already been set up for the poll workers. If you go to a precinct and it has not been set up for you, or if they sent, uh, tell you, you can go and sit in this corner or you can go and sit in this toward this room. Uh, make sure it is not some place where you cannot observe uh, that you will be able to observe what's going on. Uh, at that point, you can tell inspector, I would need to have a space in the voting area so that I can be able to um, observe mm -hmm. and uh, just be very uh, nice about it. And then at that point, if the inspector does not provide you a place where you can actually see the voting process, then you call your headquarters. Your headquarters will call downtown to the vote, um, voter administration, uh, election administration office. And at that point, something will be taken, should be taken care of that situation. Okay, next slide. This is very important. And this is a, something that we have, uh, issues have come up with this in the past in Alabama. A poll watcher must be registered in the county where you serve. Candidates and political parties may have one poll watcher at polling places. Again, remember, this is in a general election, so it will not be candidates, it will be political parties. I've already talked about not interacting with the voters. Next slide. Uh, Speaking of which, something that we have a, have had a problem with in here in Alabama, um, people are Alabamians. I'm not going to say people. Alabamians are typically not as receptive to people that are from out of state, or out of county, uh, that are observing elections. Those persons should be outside of the polling place. Uh, there is a um, certain distance, I think it's 150 feet, don't quote me on that, that they should be from the door, the entrance to the polling place. And uh, at that point, they can uh, observe, interact, uh, but they should not be inside the actual polling place. And people have been asked to leave and there has been, uh, in some cases, not confrontation, but uh, spirited debate and in this election, because it is such a critical, crucial election, we want to make sure that we do not do anything that can be misinterpreted as we are trying to um, intimidate voters, uh, tell voters who to vote for, or anything of that in that manner. 
We want to make sure, but we also want to make sure that voters are allowed to vote. One something I would like to say to poll watchers, that typically when people turn up to a precinct and they are told that they are at the wrong precinct, um, in Madison County, the iPad will print, put, print, give a printout to that voter of where their actual precinct, precinct is and directions to that precinct. They should be given that before they leave. Uh, and, and that little slip helps them to go to their actual precinct and they should not have to wait in line. They should be able to take that slip to the inspector at, at where their actual precinct is and the inspector should assist them in voting. Uh, also, I would like to say, uh, be mindful and watch if where you are assigned to work, if people are encouraged to do a lot of provisional ballots. Uh, if people are allowed, uh, encouraged doing uh, provisional ballots, if you're not seeing that inspector, letting that person know that if they do a in provisional ballot that they have until Friday to go to the courthouse and validate that ballot. A provisional ballot is not counted unless the person that submitted to the provisional ballot goes to the courthouse, any, count, any courthouse in the state of Alabama, if they did a provisional ballot, go to that county's courthouse where they voted and uh, validate that ballot. And so a lot of people, especially in some precincts uh, are told uh, you need to do a provisional ballot. And so be careful about that. If you see that, please bring that to the uh, inspector's um, attention. And also, if they are on the polling list and they have just been put as inactive, they can fill out an updated form at the polling place or at the precinct the day of the election, and they should be allowed to vote. That is not the same as um, saying that you have to do a provisional ballot. Say you voted in uh, 2018, but you didn't vote in 2019. And so it just shows you as inactive. You can update and that makes you current. The iPad is uh, um, equipped to put that information in the iPad at that time. Some precincts do, some precincts don't. Some, pre, some uh, poll workers uh, know how to do that. Some poll workers do not. So it just depends on the precinct. And the inspector and the assistant inspector should know how to go ahead and put that information in the iPad and update that person's uh, information. And at that point, they can send them, if, there's not, if they're not no longer at this precinct, uh, at the current precinct where they are at that time, they can be referred to the precinct where they would actually be allowed to vote. Next slide. Well, before we go to the next slide, we have a question. Do you have okay, to be, surely. Do you have sure, to be sure. registered in Madison County to be a poll watcher? Uh, yes. Okay. To be a poll water watcher in Madison County, you should be registered to vote in Madison County. Okay, thank you. But you can be an observer outside of the poll place and not be registered in Madison County. Thank you. Uh, is it true that persons who show up to vote uh, in an act that for second vote once they complete the voter re-identification form? It is. Um, it's not voter re-identification. Um, it is a, a specific form and it is called a uh, voter, uh, it's called update. Uh, and actually um, it depends, it, it kind of depends on the precinct. I'm gonna be honest. Uh, some precincts will accept that form uh, and go ahead and update you and you will be able to vote. Other precincts that goes back to my what I was just referring to. Some precincts will say, we will take this information, we will turn it in, but you have to do a provisional ballot at that time. Um, I would talk to an inspector and see if they have someone available to put the information in the iPad. 
So it, it kind of is one of those kind of pen situations. Uh, like I said, some precincts, uh, they have people that are very familiar with the iPad, or iPod, I should say iPod, iPod, and they can go in and update information and find just about anything that the system allows the uh, poll workers to, um, to access. Other precincts, they basically can find your name. If your name is, comes up and it says that you can vote, they, they let you vote. If it comes up and says that you're inactive, they refer you to uh, provisional. And at that point, that's when, uh, as a poll uh, watcher, you can ask the inspector if there's anyone there that can update the information. Any other questions? Okay, poll um, your wardrobe. Of course, we know as a poll watcher, you are not, even though most of us on this call are true blue Democrats, we cannot wear anything that says uh, for a for the for a particular candidate. We cannot wear anything that um, presents a particular cause that we may be um, interested in. It is basically biz, business casual, uh, be presentable, just as it says. Uh, for guys, I usually say just khakis and a college shirt. <laughs> That's usually, what, especially if it's young people. Uh, and for uh, ladies, uh, we pretty much know. I will uh, say because we have younger people doing this now and a seasoned person, so this may not apply to me, but I will uh, ask people not to wear plunge and necklines. Uh, you know, be a little bit more conservative in your dress. If you, you know, it's I'm I'm not trying to uh, censor anyone, but I just think that at this at for an election, because you're gonna have people coming from all walks of life, you're gonna have people coming from uh, um, all races, you know, all uh, religions, our creeds so that will be coming in the polling place. So you want to make sure that you're not um, offensive to anyone, if if at, at all possible. Oh, and I do recommend not wearing um, uh, 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 football shirts. I'm an avid, diehard Alabama a &M fan, but I do rec uh, ask that poll, you know, recommend the poll watchers not to wear their team shirts to poll watch. Okay, next, Cindy. We're going to be pretty much ready to wrap this up in a little bit. Next slide. We have a bunch of questions. Okay. Um, All right. Well, let's go to the questions. They're right there. Can you see them on the screen? I can see them. Okay. I think um, they start with Lori's. Mm -hmm. Well, I see one up here from Tanya Paris and Willa Poe. Well, I think we've already answered that. We Willa have. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. What do I do if a voter asks me a question? Uh, you can uh, answer their question. Uh, but you cannot tell them who to vote for. Uh, one question you get a poll as a poll watcher that I uh, would get quite a bit was, uh, especially from from seasoned citizens or our senior citizens, about how to mark the ballot. You can let them know that do not put an X that you want to just do a little circle, and when you do that, you can say um, there's a donkey and an elephant at the top of the ballot. And you can circle which circle you like. Uh, that is not giving anybody, telling anyone how to vote. And then you say, and then they may say, well, I want to vote for so-and-so. Well, you say, well, ma'am, sir, just look down there and find their name and circle, put the circle next to their name. And uh, you will get questions about the amendments. Uh, generally, people do ask questions about the amendments. Uh, you can just tell them that there, there should be a large uh, poster in all precincts that has just a summary information of the uh, uh, amendments. If that is present if you in your precinct, let's go observe and make sure that it's there. You can refer them to go and look at that spot. So well, you can go over here and look, go look on the wall. There's, they're telling you all about the amendments. Uh, and those are the types of things that you can do to uh, assist. 
Okay, Julie Lindy's question. Can you review provisional ballot process again? Who takes to courthouse by Friday? Okay. Um, a provisional ballot, if a person submits a provisional ballot, it goes, it's pretty much like an absentee ballot, but it's done on the day of the election. You go in, they give you a form, you have to fill it out, uh, that you're given a ballot, then you're given a secret envelope, and then you're given another envelope. And the inspector has to sign it, or someone, a, a, a designated worker, some inspectors and de designated people to just do provisional ballots. And at that point, uh, that provisional ballot goes in a box, like an old fashioned box that we used to use way back in the day when we voted. And it says provisional ballot, and you just stick it in that box, the person sticks it in that box. That box is then carried to the courthouse at the end of the election cycle uh, on November the 3rd. The provisional ballots then are stored at the courthouse until the Friday after the election. And, and at that point, provisional ballots are open. Uh, usually that there's a representative from the Democratic Party and a representative from the Republican Party there to observe opening to provisional ballots and then the provisional ballots are counted. It is up to the individual, the individual worker that casts the provisional ballot to go to the courthouse by Friday in order to uh, validate their ballot. If they do not go to the, but that's why it's called provisional. If they do not go to the courthouse by Friday, uh, those ballots are set aside. Only the ones that have people that have gone to the courthouse, those ballots are counted. And uh, for young people, I'm just gonna say it, and I may be a little biased, but I try to support young people. Young people might say, will we'll, we'll say I will do a provisional ballot. And then they do not, um, I may not know that they have to go to the courthouse by Friday. And so if people, that's why I'm saying, if you observe people doing provisional ballots, that the poll workers and the inspectors should let them know before they, um, submit that ballot that they do have to go to the courthouse by Friday with their uh, ID. Sarah, I'll, I want to add something here. I don't have that much experience being a, a poll watcher, but I have had to follow people out because the people, the poll workers did not tell them that they, um, they needed to go to do the provisional ballot. Exactly. Um, so I have walked outside and told them because I didn't feel like it was a, okay to do it inside or you have a funny inspector who's watching you like a hawk more than she is anything else she or he is anything else i'd follow them outside and tell them what they needed to do come back in get to the front of the line vote a provisional ballot and whatever so and you exactly. may be in a situation where you can do that easily mm -hmm. there yes. okay um, depending uh, depending on your precinct that is perfect perfectly acceptable to go if you especially if you've seen someone that's been turned away you do let them and 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 not done have not uh submitted provision ballot are given information uh to go to their uh um, polling correct polling place it is perfectly acceptable to go outside uh and tell and let that person know that's letting that person know their rights next question is if a, if a uh, member of an organization can you wear a wardrobe with the name on it it's uh, people do. Uh, once again, I'm in several organizations. I do uh, not recommend that. I recommend wearing the colors of your organization. You can wear the colors of your organization without wearing something that specifically says your organization. Better to be safe than sorry, right? All right. What if a voter can't read? Uh, if the voter cannot read in the state of Alabama, uh, they do have a right to um, still vote. Uh, the state of Alabama still accepts an X, just a letter X, as your signature for voting. If they have the, uh, I'm going to use a person that has an a ID rather than a non-driver's ID, rather than a driver's license. That person has the proper ID 
and they say, well, I can't really uh, read this or see this. They can mark an X and they can be assisted in voting. That's also part of uh, helping a person uh, with disabilities where you would assist the person, a, a poll worker would be a, usually assigned, uh, the inspector assist the person, they read the ballot to the person and the person generally can, most of the time, can make their own little circle. Uh, you cannot, they may not make a circle for who you want them to make a circle for, but <laughs> they, uh, you, they can be assisted in, in, in voting. The, uh, uh, the machine that is used for uh, handicap assistance and it has a deaf, uh, it talks to people that that machine will be working. So most inspectors really, we, you know, don't use the machine unless they absolutely have to, but it will be available. Okay. Uh, then we time, tell the voters to check their provisional ballot at the courthouse if the inspector doesn't tell them. Yes. But uh, just as Cindy said, but I would tell them, I would step out and tell them. Okay. Now we have some questions in the chat. Do you want to do those now or do you want to come back to those? We can go ahead and, and clear these questions we have right um, now and then we will show the uh, second video. Okay. Okay, I think we've covered uh, wrong place. Jocelyn, if you still have that question, uh, if you'll put it in the q and I think, I think we covered it. Question, active voters updated. What do we do if armed people show up as observers? Uh, Alabama is an uh, open uh, care state. Uh, what you can do is, um, inform the uh, inspector that someone is there with a uh, firearm. Most churches, I'm gonna say 90% of the churches uh, have a sign that says no firearms allowed. If you're in a church, your precinct is in a church and that person has a firearm, the inspector can ask them to uh, please leave we're not to ask them, tell them they cannot vote. We're asking them to please take their firearm uh, out of the building and return to vote. And the last one, that, I think that uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk about that a little bit longer. Uh, that is going to occur. I'm just going to say it. That's going to occur. Uh, sometimes people uh, just they have their firearm, not really like on brandishing it or anything, but they want you to know that they have a firearm. And so when they uh, go to get their ballot or when they go to deposit their ballot, they do it in such a way that you can see that they are armed. Uh, if they do not do anything else other than letting you know that they're carrying, and sometimes people do that to see what you're gonna do. And so if they don't do uh, anything but then you know that they have a firearm. Um, sometimes it's best not to do anything. The flip side of that is if a person comes, and I've seen this happen, if a person comes in with their hunting rifle on their shoulder, that is different. At that point, the inspector should ask the person to leave and, and take their weapon out. If they do not, we are to, the inspector is to call the Madison County Sheriff Department. The larger precincts generally have a sheriff on site, uh, on and off. Uh, the sheriffs and police, uh, uh, local police departments do come out in throughout the day, the day and check on the precincts. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, uh, the sheriffs are within, can reach a precinct within a certain uh, length of uh, amount of time. And so that is how uh, that would be handled. Uh, at any point, we do not want to um, agitate the person with the firearm in such that they may uh, not act appropriately. Okay, Sarah, there's another question here that's a good one. What happens if there's not time for the person who is at the wrong precinct, wrong voting precinct to get to the correct precinct? They can vote a provisional ballot. 
Okay, so you can, if they're not told that, you can uh, tell them that they can vote a provisional. They can vote a provisional ballot. And then, then they still have to go down. And and, they still have to go down. Yeah, okay. Okay. When will we have specific information regarding our shift time and location? I can answer that one. It's gonna be in a few days. Everybody's working really hard to get people into the training and figuring out where, where they want us to. We've got priority precincts. Sarah, you've been through that part before. Right. We've got priority precincts. We'll staff those fully first, only one of you at a time. And then it'll be, I'm gonna say by the end of the week, uh, and I hope that it happens that soon. It's much more complicated process this time because of the numbers of people that we have signed up. And even though there's 66 of you, that this isn't everybody. I'm gonna close the, yeah, you'll be able to select your time. You'll have input on that. Mm -hmm. You should, um, when you signed up, uh, you can uh, go back and let them know what time you prefer. Mm -hmm. Keeping in mind the things I talked about at first. Um, no. Sorry, they'll accommodate location too if you request a location. If they can't, they have to work yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, if all possible, they, can, they will uh, give you the location that you request. Okay, next slide. You ready for that? Ready for the next slide. I think we've covered all that. Be respectful and polite. Understand that election officials have the final say. I will say something about that. That is very important that, again, we, you don't wanna win the battle and lose the war. Understand that election officials have the final say. And I'm just gonna say, I'm a seasoned person, but in all the precincts that I have worked, I'm, I'm a floater now, so, uh, Judge Barger sends me pretty much wherever he uh, thinks he has a need. Um, they, so the inspectors and the people in the polling place are seasoned people. Uh, so that being said, uh, they may their demeanor might be like your grandmother's demeanor, or like the lady who lived down the street from you growing up. Everybody knows that lady who lived down the street from them when they were growing up. Their demeanor might be like like that person. But at the end of the day, they have a final say. Please leave. If they ask you to leave their precinct, or they ask you to take a seat or whatever, please do so. Make a note or go outside and call your uh, the party or whoever you're representing, even though we are all, all representing the party, and I call downtown and say, this is what is happening at this particular precinct. What can be done about it? You all, we will all have the elections office number. It's always on the uh, list of information given to poll watchers. As far as when you'll get your certificate, we're scheduling to have those ready for you possibly Sunday, but Sunday and Monday at our headquarters, you'll be able to stop by and pick up your letter. It's just a form signed by the county chair and that's what you take and give to the poll inspector that should allow you to stay there. Right. You will also get a number if there are really critical problems and mm -hmm. nobody is doing anything to help it uh, at the precinct, you'll get a number you can call that uh, usually goes into a bunch of attorneys mm -hmm. who can call the right people, make things happen. You exactly. don't want to inter intervene, intervene and try to fix something yourself. You just call. And there's also a little software package called LBJ that I think we're gonna have available for everybody. And in fact, that may be what the state training is on more than what we've trained on. This mm -hmm. LBJ thing, you just pull it up on your smartphone. Uh, you can actually make a report if something goes wrong and right. it's got numbers there for you to call. It has the numbers for you to call. That information should be uh, uh, gonna say that, and the information that they give you with your um, certificate, hopefully uh, that information will be available to you where you have the numbers and everything and how to link to the uh, LBJ um, uh, app. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right, next slide. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, you, we will contact you. We just talked about that saying that the assignments and will be available when you pick up your uh, certificates next Sunday and Monday at the headquarters for Madison County. If you're from another county, please contact your party 
uh, that that local party, uh, that local party's chair, and find out when you when and where you can pick up your certificates. We already covered that. Uh, and so, okay, go ahead. So you Okay, we pretty much covered that. We've developed a structure for how you can uh, report uh, problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you should have your phone number, your, I mean, your cell phone charger. Uh, okay. These things will pretty much be in your bag. Well, not yeah, your phone are... or your charger, but. <laughs> but your contact number is your manual. Uh, there will be a pen. Uh, then, of course, we asked that you, we talked about food, drinks. Usually, we provide a bottle of water. And if you, I'm going to say about parking. If you are, because we will be on Central Time. We'll be on Central Time on by the day of election. So, if you're working the second shift, uh. uh Make sure that you plan your parking so that you will, will be in a well lit. Because when you go in, it's going to be daylight. When you come out, it's going to be dark. Make sure that you're in a uh, well, try to get in a well look place. Uh, observe to see if where the lights are, where you're parking, and park at that place. When you're leaving uh, the polling place, it may be at night. If you're leaving and there is not a line and you're just leaving yourself, try to get a buddy. You know, buddy system. Two people leave the polling place together and wait for both persons to get into their cars and secure in their cars before pulling off. Mm -hmm. Okay, fundamentals. Serve, uh, assist, uh, resolve, report. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we covered that. Yeah, we've covered oh, this, but I'm, I'm just, mm -hmm, but it's going to be a registered voter. Do not speak. Uh, Inact with voters. This comes down to, and we have a lot of this in some polling places. Uh, I know I've worked in polling places where I know pretty much, uh, not all people, but a good portion of people that come in, um, they're going to speak to you. Go ahead and speak to the person. Don't be rude. Speak to the person, but don't get into any, even if they attempt to get an interaction about the election or about a particular politician, just say, well, oh, well I'll talk to you. You know, I have to do this. And I'll talk to you next week or whatever. And and just kind of, as the, as the people say, keep it moving. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we talked about this. And uh, this is something that's important. Do not take any photographs. Um, Sometimes that is up to the discretion of the inspector. Um, you can make note. I do know that people that come in with their children that are voting for the first time, I've never seen an inspector tell them that they cannot take a picture of that child uh, at by the polling place or for their first uh, vote. And so that is something that happens, you can just make a note of it, but that's really not something that's uh, portable. Uh, just make a note that they their pitches were allowed. And that's that's pretty much it on that one. Next. Is there a list of irregularities to look for? Uh, let's go ahead and uh, we have not showed the find a second video. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that gonna cover that? Do you wanna? Um, Yes, and then I'll go over these basics at the end. Okay. You want the video now? I'm sorry. Is that what you said? Yes, yes, the second video. Okay. And people, we started at about 6.15 and I prom I mean 5.15 and I promise you that we will be finished by 6.15. Okay, and I need to um, change the method in which we take roll. If you're able to reach chat, just put something down because your name is going to be on there most likely, unless you're calling from your phone, put your name in there. Just put your name into the chat and I'll take roll that way. If you're on your phone and you're concerned that your name isn't showing up, stay on and I'll get your names after we're finished. Sorry about that, but mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be... 
if you are on an iPhone, you can still go into chat. Uh, some Android should be able to do it also. You can still go into chat. Put Even though your number is going to come up, put your name and your number. And if possible, put your email if you're on an iPhone uh, and send that, that. And that way we will have to make sure that we have double coverage. I'll just take the chat. Uh, I'll get a, li a list. I'll get the chat when the thing is over with. So right. I can take roll that way. A poll watcher is someone who is typically designated to serve as an observer at the canvas and the canvas or the counting of ballots. And their presence generally increases transparency oh. in the election process. And we they hear it, but we don't see it. Or elections administrators to notice. You hear it, but you don't see it. We hear it, but we don't see it. I'm going to stop sharing and see if I can't um, just start our, our all, start all over again. I have this problem with videos sometimes. Okay. Uh, Give me a second. Just a second. Okay. Well, I'm just what? Oh, you got it up now. Okay. Yeah. Poll watcher is someone who is typically designated to serve as an observer at a point place and the canvas or the counting of ballots. And their presence generally increases transparency in the election process and they are an extra set of eyes for elections administrators to notice and bring any irregularities to the attention of officials. I'm urging my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully. They're called poll watches, a very safe, very nice thing. When you have someone of the president's authority saying something like that, uh, rank and file Americans who support the president and, and want to be helpful just, you know, will show up on election day and go, well, I'm here to watch the polls. And you just can't show up um, and start watching the polls. <laughs> In almost every state, they have to be designated or appointed in advance by a particular party or a candidate. They're often limited in the number of people that can be appointed service poll watchers. Usually, there has to be a confirmation in writing delivered to the election administrators confirming that appointment. And then the poll watchers have to have specific badges identifying them at the polling place so that voters know who they are. But there are also limits on what they can do. Typically, poll watchers can't talk to or interact with voters. So poll watchers are not get out the vote volunteers. They are specifically designated to observe in polling places and at the canvas and are not supposed to be interacting with voters at all. They're not permitted to be doing electioneering activities in the polling place or within the electioneering boundary. And the intimidation laws that prohibit intimidation of voters apply also to poll watchers. So anything that would interfere with, intimidate, or scare a voter from casting their ballot, poll watchers are subject to those laws as well. Any kind of voter intimidation is a federal crime, and in most states, it's a state crime as well. The president's rhetoric in trying to recruit poll watchers is concerning, particularly because of the militant nature of the rhetoric and his continuing refusal to disavow violent white nationalists. But the president, like any candidate, also has the prerogative to recruit observers. The rhetoric around poll watchers and challengers is itself designed to scare voters away from the polls and no voter should be deterred by anybody using fear mongering to prevent them from casting a ballot. This is Mongolia, and we <laughs> are not. Sorry. Hey, Sarah, we're back. All right. Uh, 
I'm back. Uh oh. Yeah, video is over. Okay, I saw that it was over. Thank you. Are uh, there? I see that we have um, several questions. One thing I wanted to say that I observed on the video was that it showed the lady, young lady with a, a badge and a, a photo ID. That, but no, in the state of Alabama, there is a name tag that you will get from the inspector. The inspector has that name tag, and it's a. Uh, um, uh, um, you can put your name on it. Uh, that is um, how you would uh, be identified as a poll watcher. Okay. And uh, also, um, I would like to say that uh, about another thing I saw on the uh, video, it talked about poll watchers not being um, there for a specific particular party or anything. So at that point, that is uh, um, how um, how we would be able to uh, know that we are doing the right thing. One of the folks who's helping with the assignments asked that everybody put their name, phone number, and email into the um, uh, chat when you reply to us. Uh, if you're if you got the email directly from info at Madison County Democrats. Dot com, you won't need to do that. We have it. If you did not, please somehow get that to us today while you're on the training. Um, there's one question here. Uh, what are regulations and recommendations regarding wearing masks? And Sarah's mm -hmm. muted. There you go. I'm, I'm back. Sarah's back. Um, the same in, in Madison County. Uh, the regulation is that we wear masks. That's the county regulation for this county. However, the state um, attorney general has come out saying that we cannot make persons that come to vote wear a mask. We can only recommend that they wear a mask. If someone comes in without a mask, usually a poll worker, not a poll watcher, will encourage the person to put on a mask. If they refuse, we make a note of it, not a note of it. If there's law enforcement present, they may or may not intervene and ask the person to wear a mask. That's why it's very important that we, the people that are watching the polls, are working in the polls, take all precautions that we can to protect ourselves as wearing a mask. Someone um, had had in the questions about wearing um information that may show um, the affiliation with an organization. You can wear a mask that has affiliation of your organization. I recommend. I do not recommend the organization's name. I recommend uh, the colors of your organization. There are, um, there are some, uh, um, some masks that talk about voting. Any mask that talks about voting, would be appropriate because it's not telling you to vote Republican or Democrat. It's just telling you to vote, get out the vote. That mask would be uh, appropriate. Um, any mask that has a slogan on it, there are a lot of slogans that are, are very popular now. I'm trying to not mention anything in particular, but I would not wear a mask that promoted a particular slogan or, um, or anything like that. I, what I actually recommend, if all possible, get an N945 mask. Uh, the county will have some masks available, but if you are working the poll, uh, watching the polls and you have some type of underlying condition, condition, I recommend you get an N95 mask to have for yourself, for your own protection, because you are volunteering your service. We don't want anything to happen to you. We don't want you to have anything uh, that as a result of working the, watching the polls. Another question, my husband and I are both attending this training. Can we work, be assigned to the same location in the same shift? Um, I generally would say uh, maybe. <laughs> if that I would, I could, you could go for it. It would be up to the inspector to say that I can only accept one or, or not. Actually, because we're only supposed to have one. Because you're only there. supposed to have one. That's why yeah. I'm saying it would be up to the inspector. Some, some inspectors will go ahead and let 
husband and wife, couples uh, work together. It, it, it really is up to the inspector. And uh, again, someone asked, do we, uh, will I be able to uh, watch in Madison City where I live? And the answer to that is yes, you've already, this yes. person's already turned in that request and they, they yes. are aware of it. Mm -hmm. I'm looking yes. for more questions here. Because uh, some again, of them didn't Again, go the certificates way. will be out um, on Sunday and Monday at the headquarters, you will, that's where you will receive your certificate. Right. Uh, can we tell voters to check their provisional ballot at the courthouse? Yes, if the inspector does not tell them, you definitely can tell that person to do that. What sorts of problems are encountered with voter IDs? Um, types of problems that are encountered with voter IDs, typically, um, Sometimes we'll have a person that still has an uh, uh, out-of-state uh, uh, driver's license, for instance, but they have moved here and everything else is here. Uh, we are supposed to accept that. Some inspectors will and some inspectors will not. I mean, well, don't like to, I won't say will not, don't like to. Um, but they sort of have to, right? But, but they should. If they're in the system and it has everything, uh, it, it says a, a valid driver's license. Where the stickler comes in is that that valid driver's license from Kansas is going to have your Kansas address on it. It's not going to have your Madison City or uh, Gurley address on it. And so that is when, and I've seen that people go back and forth with the inspectors on that. At that point, you ask the people if they, if they uh, let the people know that if they're giving them, a, they can call downtown and downtown should inform them that the people are allowed to vote. That is the one of the biggest issues. And that, that's an issue you also see with uh, uh, college students. And also with college students, they'll have three addresses. They have the address from uh, Missouri, where they're from, they have their hospital address uh, and uh, then they will have moved and they will have another address. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, if the inspector says they have to do a provisional ballot, it's really not a whole lot you can do about it. What if the voting location is posted mask required to enter? That's going to be up to the inspector to enforce, right? Correct. Well, like I said before, we cannot enforce that because the Attorney General, the Attorney General for the state of Alabama has said, we cannot enforce that. He has uh, overruled, I'm just gonna say overruled. He has overruled his local uh, probate judges. All the judges did not do that, but the local probate judges that did uh, mandate that masks were required in polling places, he made a uh, opinion, and his opinion was that we could not require people to wear masks. Okay. We can recommend uh, we can recommend people wear masks. We will have uh, some masks available. Every every precinct will have masks available. The uh, county is providing the county elections is providing some masks for every precinct. If someone comes without a mask, you can give them a mask. Offer them a mask, but we cannot make them wear a mask. Okay, I am um, about to put the address and the website into the chat for everyone. I'm not giving you hours because you'll need to check the website to see the hours on the day that you're attending, that you're gonna go by headquarters to get your, your letter. And yeah, Stephanie Burton, it is a state requirement to wear a mask. So the attorney general went over uh, the governor as well. He did, that was his, that was, that was his opinion. That's yeah. what I said, the governor did put that out. And he, and of course, being the uh, state's attorney general, he can make a uh, opinion on any uh, ruling that's put out. And that is his opinion. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is in court right now uh, from the, um, the universities uh, and uh, Southern Rural Health challenging his opinion. 
So if you're looking for headquarters, it's across from the Super Walmart on Sparkman Drive, not far from the parkway. And it's in a two-story yellow brick building. You, you, can't, you can't miss it if you're looking that way, but it's across from the Super Walmart. It's between uh, North Parkway and Blue Springs Road. All right. If you're coming from North Parkway, uh, right after you pass um, the uh, car dealership, uh, start looking for it. It's that, it's that first traffic light. Uh, the, the headquarters is, will be on your left if you're coming from the parkway. If you're coming on uh, Sparkman uh, around uh, close to Blue Springs, when you cross Blue Springs Road, uh, after you pass, um, you'll pass several businesses and after you, uh, then you see it on the right, right at the entrance where you would make the main turn into the Walmart Supercenter parking lot. That's a good, yeah, uh, you're going to turn in at that first, uh, first stop yeah, light. First stop, first, first stop light. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, people were confused, uh, including myself at the very beginning, that was thinking the headquarters was down near uh, the UAH area of Sparkman and that uh, and those office buildings. If you know someone that's not on this call tonight, but will be watching other recording, please let them know that it is the building is located on North Parkway. Uh, I mean, on Sparkman near North Parkway, across from the uh, Sparkman Drive Super Walmart. I see three people on here named Nancy. If you're Na if you're Nancy and it's not Molaire, I need you to put your full name into the chat. And if you have a phone number, please just if you're just here on your phone, please hang on so we can be sure we capture and get you credit for taking this class. So I think that's all the questions. I'm okay, pretty sure. I don't I don't see any other questions. I would I'd like to thank everyone for uh, their time tonight. And we're pretty close. And I'd also like to thank uh, Representative Laura Hall, Representative Annie Daniels, Senator Doug Jones. And I want to thank all of our partners. I'm not going to call any names. All of our partners uh, throughout the uh, county and the state that are training poll watchers. And we want to make sure that we have a fair, free election. And everyone that is qualified to vote, that comes out to vote, is allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I would make a reminder that uh, in-person absentee balloting voting is available through uh, October the 29th. And the 29th is on a Thursday, not a Friday. So if anyone is planning to uh, know anyone is planning to go and uh, in-person absentee vote, uh, make sure they know that the deadline for that is on Friday at 4.30. If you are in line at 4.30, you will be allowed to cash your absentee vote. I encourage all persons that um, have challenges or the lines are gonna be long, if they can go uh, to the courthouse between now and the 29th, do so. But at the courthouse, the line, the wait can be up to two hours. On Friday, the, the wait, the process, I shouldn't say wait, the process from start to finish, uh, in some instances, it was up to two hours. So even if you go to the courthouse, be prepared to wait. Generally, the best two days to go to the courthouse are Tuesday and Wednesday. That Thursday being that it's going to be the last day, they are expecting um, lots of people to come out and vote. If you are 70 years old or older, or if you're a person that is physically challenged, you do not have to get in the line. You can go to the front of the line. Uh, and uh, and cash your absentee vote. That also is uh, the same at on November 3rd, the day of a general election. If you are 70 years of age and are physically uh, challenged uh, or a person with disabilities, you can go to the front of the line uh, and vote. You do not have to stand in that line. I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me, Sarah. We I thought we were done, but we have a couple more questions. Do we okay. have to report the machine counts? And somebody was asking, do we do this periodically through the day? Is there any requirement to do that? Uh, there's not a requirement to uh, report machine counts. Some, um, if you are, even though you're a Democratic 
a poll watcher, but you are uh, affiliated with a candidate. Some candidates do like to know the council after day. That is up to the uh, inspectors. Some inspectors um, will will do that, and some inspectors um, will not allow you to do that. Okay. And the next question is: uh, When do the absentee votes get counted? Uh, the absentee votes will be counted on November the 3rd, uh, at, uh, starting at uh, 12 noon. And I talked to, uh, I talked to Judge Barr personally on Friday, and uh, he assured me that, uh, not just me, but those of us that were present at that time, that every vote would be counted uh, he didn't know how long it was going to take a while, but they were going to start at 12 noon and ever how long it took them to count the, all the ballots, they would be counted. He is uh, going to count. Make sure people understand this correctly because I had to get it in my little, my little pea brain. <laughs> but um, if a ballot is postmarked November the 3rd, he is going to count that ballot if it arrives after uh, November uh, the 3rd. Uh, absentee ballots should be, if they carry to the court, uh, courthouse, they should have a, the law say, I mean, the, the rule is that it's not really law. The rule is and tradition has been that uh, postmark on second and received on, on the third, by 12, 12 noon on the third. If um, because of the situation with the U.S. Postal Service, he is allowing, I think he is allowing until Friday when they um, count the provisional ballots. Any ballots that are received up until the time they count the provisional ballots will be counted. That being said, any ballots that have been mailed, uh, if you carried them in person, you should be, it should be okay because the uh, that the courthouse should have checked it before you sealed it, before you uh, cast your ballot. Any ballots that have been mailed uh, are dropped off. Uh, there was a drop off, there's a drop off place. Once that ballot is open, if the ballot, some instances we know people have sent their ballots in and said, well, I don't need both of these envelopes. I'm just going to put it in this one big envelope. If it is not in a secret ballot envelope, it will not be counted. Uh, some people have not had their ballots witnessed properly. Uh, it did, did not have to be notarized, but it did have to be witnessed. If it is not witnessed, that ballot will not be counted. Uh, let me give another scenario. Those are the main two. Also, um, if um, uh, I'm not going to worry too much about the signature, but if there's anything in the top portion of the ballot, the uh, uh, identifying uh, identity section of the ballot. If anything in the identity section of the ballot uh, does not really match what's on your, um, what they have in the system with if, if your voter registration information, that ballot may or may not be counted. That will be up to the discretion of the, uh, of the elections office. So. Sarah, I was on a, uh conference call with the Chamber of Commerce and Deborah Kaiser and Frank Barger a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago. Right. And they said that they were going to start counting the ballots at 7 a.m. because there were so many of them. Right. So that, is, that is correct. That is correct. Okay. But that's why I said that they had to be um, uh, uh, back to the old rule of where we used to get the mail like the next day, <laughs> where that's why they said 12 noon, because the morning mail would have arrived by 12 noon. Gotcha. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, someone asked about is, are we going to have somebody watching the um, absentee ballot counting and opening? And the answer, and I just found this out, Sarah doesn't even know this yet, that we do have an attorney who is right. a hardcore, dedicated Democrat, mm -hmm. and they will be there uh, all day, as far as I know, watching the ballots being opened and processed. They open them, you know, they're in two envelopes. They open them and then they feed them through a machine, just like okay. other right. ballots get counted. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. And will the last poll watcher on the last shift be required to report the voting 
cites voting totals after the polls close? Uh, that depends on that poll watcher. That was what we talked about at the beginning. Uh, we do recommend that you uh, call a total in uh, to um, your county. Uh, usually they, they have a poll watcher um, strip. They will give you a strip with totals on it uh, for you to carry to your party. But once again, if, you, if you're going to decide as a poll worker that you want to do that, that means that you will have to stay there until if the if the people around the block and down the street, you have to stay there until after all the people have voted before you can get that information. And so uh, I, I do know that poll workers have said, I want to stay. And then it gets to be an hour or it gets to be. This year, I really think I have been at the poll at a uh, precinct up until 10 o'clock at night and the inspector still has to go downtown and take uh, all the information to uh, all the equipment to the courthouse. So uh, if you're going to, if you're a poll watcher and you're going to work that, that shift that ends at 7 p.m., if you choose to do that, please make sure that you are prepared to stay a couple of hours, or at least, you may not have to stay until the very end, but you have to stay at least until the machines have been, um, the tabs have been printed on the machines. And at that point, the inspector will allow you to leave. The sheriff will come by to uh, get information out of, uh, get the information that he needs out of the machine. That's one of the first things the inspector has to prepare because the sheriffs, the sheriffs come by and, and pick that up. I think that's it. Sarah, we may be okay. done. Okay. And we did Any keep you longer, but you had lots of questions. No, no problem. I, uh, I'm i just happy to do it. I'm happy to be of service uh, to Madison County and to the nation. This is a very, I, I, this is going to be, and I am very serious about this. This is a crucial election, people. This election to me has been, is as crucial as it was in the 60s. Everything that I'm thinking about now, I'm saying, I went through this during the 60s, even though I wasn't a voter at that time. Uh, I was a tag along with my mother. And uh, now this is the same type of election. This election will have general rational consequences with the leadership that is elected. So I employ all Democrats. I know we don't have a lot of people on the uh, local ballots, but anyone that we have on the local ballots, encourage those people, work for those people, try to get as many people out to vote. Uh, and because if at all possible, this election should not be close where it will end up in the courts. This election should be decided it will it possibly will not be decided on November 3rd but after all the votes are counted that there is no question of who the winner of this election is and of course being a diehard Democrat I am hopeful and prayerful that Joe Biden will be the president and I will go ahead and say it ladies my son Senator Kamala Harris will be the vice president of the United States of America because we are living in very crucial times. And don't believe the polls. Go vote. No, don't, don't believe, believe the polls. God bless you and everyone have a good evening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. If you had a phone number, please hang on here. And I'm going to read off the last digits of those phone numbers. I don't know who you are. 6380. 7140-4294, and I don't have Acacia's last name, or Bill's last name, or Krista's last name. If you put it in there, great, you can go on. Jenny's last name, Kim's last name, Jay-Z Boz, maybe is that your name, or give us your first name, Lisa S., I uh, got at least one more of the Nancys. There's a Patricia in here and that's it. Thank y'all so much. And thanks for being patient with us having to take roll <laughs> in such an archaic way. Uh, no problem. And please put your emails in there because uh, the ladies who are gonna be assigning need to be able to email you if you haven't already.
Okay, Sarah, I guess you can go and I'll oh, just okay. stay here and wait for this to, uh, for people to stop commenting. That that tape is going to go automatically onto my hard drive as soon as. Oh, okay. oh we have that many comments? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, there's been a lot. A lot? Okay. <laughs> I see, but I will send a comment uh, before I leave. Okay. You're welcome, Alice. Mm -hmm. Thanks for thanking us. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you are on a phone and you cannot reach the chat, text me your name, email, and phone number, preferably your cell, well, your cell, uh, to 256 Six five one four two four one. That's six five one four two four one. That's if you can't reach the chat. Sarah, I think we're I think we're done. Nobody has been hanging out for a couple of minutes now. So okay. All thank right. you. Okay, have a good fun to work with you. Okay. I hope it wasn't too much background noise there. For a minute there was background noise. Was it real bad? No, I didn't even okay. notice it. There was some on my end too. Okay, great. But, but mine is because my husband is cooking dinner. 